Thank you for joining us this week on the Cult of SMMI. We are continuing our conversation with Patricia. It's, quite frankly, got me on the edge of my seat. Um, I do have to remind everybody, the perspectives, viewpoints, and assertions expressed within this show, the Cult of SMMI, are reflective of the guest's individual stance and do not inherently represent the positions held by the host, this podcast, or our network, Sparrow Manor Podcasting. We are unable to corroborate nor dismiss the assertions made by the guest. This podcast merely serves as a platform for each guest to recount their narratives as they recollect it. With that in mind, Patricia. I was having um, something either psychological, but I was passing out and I would stay like on the ground for like, or, you know, on the floor, for, like two or three hours. And then I would revive. No one would help me. I would just stay there. And I didn't know what was causing it. So then they have me go into psychiatric ward. And then they say I had an eating disorder because I lost so much weight. That wasn't caused by me. That was ca- the reason why I didn't eat or drink is because I was afraid to go to the bathroom. Because if I go to the bathroom, I'm being disobedient, you know. When I came home from the hospital, though, before I went into the psychiatric ward, Mother General made me kneel on, you know, in the chapel on the, the kneeler. And she yelled at me. And I collapsed. And then she said, okay, at that point, she, you know, she, she's, she's done with me. So she had me go, you know, in, into the dormitory and sleep because I was, like, really tired up. And then that's when they decided, like, a couple months later after I was passing out other times in the chapel, um, that they were going to put me in psychiatric ward. So they tried to put me on all these medicines and they're trying to say, oh, this is because of what happened to you when you were a child. And, you know, I couldn't talk about what's happened to me in the order to the therapist. I couldn't talk about what I witnessed, you know. And then they send me to this religious um, in Meriden, Connecticut, the Franciscan Sisters or whatever. Um, it's community, but they it's a psychiatric center. So they sent me there, you know, for counseling. And... The sister was telling them, don't pressure her to go into the chapel. She's she's having some type of psychosis. You know, something really bad is going on. But they kept pressing and pressing and pressing. And um, it got worse and worse and worse, of course. I had a spiritual director at that time. But the mother general decided to take him away because she said I was manipulative. So at the really hard time of my life, I had no supports, no friends, nothing. And, yeah, I just wanted to die, you know. And so um, they knew it. They knew it, and they just didn't care, you know. And they acted like it was like, oh, she's just having a fit. She's throw. No, really, I was like, I didn't know what to do with myself, you know. How would you feel? If you went through something like that, you know, and I, and what I probably should have done, I tried to let Bishop Egan know because he was close. Um, because when they did a picture, everybody else was smiling, but me, and he kind of looked at me sternly, you know, Uh he's like, you better smile. And then later on, I realized that (laughs) Bishop uh, later became Cardinal Egan was covering up the abuse of the sisters minor Mary Immaculate committed because the mother founders was covering up the abuse that his priest and him committed. Mm. So this, this is what I'm saying. It's not just the order. It is also the collab. I'm not saying it's the church in general. I'm just saying there is Bishop Egan, William Lurie knew, you know, Bishop Dupre. When I finally left in 2003, I had representatives, Sisters of St. Joseph, come down to see me on behalf of Bishop Dupre. We had a long meeting. 
she said the bishop wanted me to go back to school. I obeyed. Okay, 10 years went by. And then, well, of course, Bishop Dupre gets, you know, finds out that he's a sexual abuser himself, sexual abuse to altar boys. And he's also burned a lot of records of priest abuse and, you know, whatnot. Mine was included. So 10 years more of abuse went on after I reported it to the Diocese of Springfield. 10 more years. That was like, that is the biggest cross that I could possibly carry. Because there was one sister who died without seeing her parents before she died. She died of cancer. So, like, I didn't know all this stuff while I was in the order. But I knew all this stuff afterwards. And I'm just like, how, how, can, how can we do better in screening these people? This, this should have never happened. Okay, so I don't know if Michael Kovacs told you, but Patrizzi, the name Patrizzi goes long back to Cardinal Patrizzi. There's a Patrizzi um, family that served the Vatican um, for many, many years. Mm -hmm. So that's just what I'm saying. It's not just Mother Maria Elizabeth the Patrizzi. It's the allowance of the, the church not doing the right thing, not screening appropriately, to see if this person's seen or not. Why would they have her find an order if she left her come light order? Right. You know? And when she decided to not, when she decided to step down and she wanted to find another order after this niece, don't you think that's a little, like, unorthodox? Like, it, like wouldn't the church, like, frown upon that? You would think, right? I'm I'm not familiar with the, the Catholic Church. I've... I was raised Lutheran. I, I joke it's Catholic light, same religion, half the guilt. Pretty, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> pretty but, much. There's, but no, I, there's not a lot of difference, really. Uh, but yeah. I'm, just saying, I'm just saying, okay, if you're looking at this as a logical person, knowing the logistics of the Catholic Church, you would say this would take years and years and years for her to, to have an order approved. Yeah, yeah. The, I, there should be some sort of... Okay, why did you leave the order? What did you disagree with them with? And, you know, okay, we're going to put you on a probationary period. And at any point, if, like, if we're, we're seeing some sort of signs of abuse, and I mean, it seems like all that anybody would have to do is look at how wafer thin a lot of the sisters were in this. You know, okay. speaking to each each sister independently, you know, one on one, it doesn't seem like this would have been something that would have been hard to figure out if some due diligence would have been executed. Yeah. And that's the thing. When they finally, in 2014, I guess they had a whole bunch of psychiatrists from the Vatican interrogating sisters. And that's when, that's when things broke loose about the abuse and, and corruption. I mean, there just wasn't just not abuse. There was corruption there. But there, I want to, to emphasize the issue of human trafficking is very, very much founded in religious life because you go where you're supposed to go. That's the obedience. So say a religious order like my own says, we're all going to Italy and you're going to work on the farm. You know, and that's the day until you die. You know, you do that because that's the obedience, you know, and mm -hmm. it doesn't it doesn't matter. You don't have a say in that, you know, and I think there's a huge problem with that when and also Patrice, she gradually she was always declaring herself a saint. And I'm just like, what? I says, wait a minute. Saints don't declare themselves saints. They usually say they're sinners, you know. Um, and I'm no saint. I'll be the first one to say that, you know. Um, but she, she'd be like, oh, yeah, someday, you know, they're going to canonize me. And I know the two sisters that are closer to the sacred heart of Jesus. She would do that as a form of competition. Turn sister against sister. You know. Mm -hmm. And it took me a while to realize that because I'm like, oh. What, what is she saying here? You know, and it's just like, so many things has happened to me in my life, but especially in the order, I haven't even begun to process a lot of stuff. It just like, 
I mean, when I when I'm talking to you, I'm shocked that I lived through all this. If I stayed in Italy, I probably would have died, yeah. you know. And that's the truth because now I have an autoimmune disorder and I have asthma is like one of the worst parts of it and you know, when I had COVID, it really did a number two. And, um, but that is the result. I never had asthma as a child. Mm -hmm. I was a healthy individual going into the order, came back with all these issues. And I, when I came back, I actually had a disability. I could not work. I had to walk with a cane until I got stronger. You know, it took me about a couple of years to get better. But I went to school, and then I now I have a degree in mental health. Well, I have a, a associate's and master's in a bachelor's um, in uh, counseling. So I'm a mental health counselor, you know, and then I have in play therapy as well, too. So the reason why I did that, because I wanted to understand why these people behave the way they have and why, and, and why would somebody cover something up, you know, because I want to understand myself, but... I wanted to understand why they were being the way they were, you know, like there has to be a deeper understanding. And, um, and then I learned about cult cultism, you know, and, and basically the ritual cult cultism. And the more and more I found out from Michael Kovacs, what the, what the sisters of mine of Mary Immaculate were truly about, the more everything made sense to me. And then I could say, wait a minute, it's not me. But sometimes I I still go through, oh, this this is all me. I just have to stop it and grow up, you know? And it's just like, no, how can you grow up from something like this? How can you not think about it? So this is a plague that is put on every single soul that has entered the order or has been affiliated with that order. There is a, a deep darkness that even I think Michael Kovacs says you would learn to respect. And I think in, in some ways that is so true that you learn to respect not to ever get into that um, zone, you know. So that was another reason why I had to um, cover my name up because people were coming to me and telling me their stories and I was putting it out there but I didn't want the it be traced back to me who mm -hmm. was you know the advocate so I was like but now I don't care because I mean what can they do I said let them go try I say bring it on <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know? spoilers for anybody listening to this the the SMI currently is a shadow of its former self Exactly. Yeah. I did find out most recently that there are brothers and sisters in Italy. They're under a bishop. They are following the spirituality that um, Mother Maria Elisabetta Patrizzi has um, started. Um, I'm not sure if it's within the obedience of the Vatican, but it is under a bishop. So there is such a thing as a bishop can oversee an order you know, for, con you know, continuation until it dies out. So that might be an issue with that. Mm -hmm. But what's going on with Teresa and her so-called whatever subordinates that she has, um, it's nothing. Um, and the bishop has told me from Metuchen, um, the the people from Metuchen is saying that is we recognize it as not an order it doesn't belong to the Catholic Church. They're not allowed to go into active ministry. If they are, they need to be reported. So uh, let's let's take a few steps backwards here. Okay. Uh, we, we were talking about how your twin sister was helping you escape. Okay, yeah. So this, this okay, so <clears throat> she got her friend, because she doesn't drive either. She doesn't have spatial dyslexia, but she just chooses not to drive. So she got her friend... Um, Julia to help drive down to Connecticut and so I was to leave so I left on the day that I knew Teresa Kovacs wouldn't be there you know so you don't want to go to head to head with Teresa okay so I waited and I said to Sister Joan I'm leaving I said I'm done I'm leaving so I go in I look like a mental patient okay my hair is cut short like really like um, bad you know I have on a blue skirt you know, that's supposed to be the slip under the habit. And I have a white shirt 
and that is it. And I might be wearing shoes. And that's all I have with me. I have no belongings, nothing. I'm, so I go to the train station, wait there, and hope that the police don't pick me up and bring me back to the convent. You know, so I'm just waiting there. And then my twin sister and I, um, I, we meet up and with her friend Julia and we drive back to Massachusetts, which is only a state away. And so the next day, amazingly, amazingly, the mother general got a, um, what it's called, a dispensation from the Holy Father at that time, Pope John Paul II, um, for me to, to be dispensed from my vows. I said, well, what does she do? Have a whole bunch of blanks and just spells them out at random, you know? Mm -hmm. So to me, that wasn't concrete. Oh, I also have to tell you, my novitiate was very short too. At, okay. at best, it was only eight months. It's supposed to be 12 months by canon law. So, hmm. so no. yeah. That's what I'm saying about corruption. I mean, it was um, theologically corrupt, but also like civically corrupt as well, too. Now, I, I know that another member that I've talked about talks about her escape, how she she walked to Staten Island and got yes. stopped on the bridge. And yes. just an absolute incredible story. Were you in the SMMI at that point? And how did they explain her disappearance? Okay, so no, I didn't have no idea about Sarah Bell or her. Mother um, Patrice screened everything. She, we were not allowed to go on TV. We had no radio. We had no, no phones. Um, the only phone that was is one in the convent, and that's it. We had nothing else. We were not allowed to call out. Um, the only time we saw something was the 9-11. That was it. Um, so, we went over to the priest's house and we saw what was going on with the 9-11. Um, that, that was the only day. So it was, it was possible that like other, other people escaped and just, they just disappeared one day. You never, you never knew what happened to them at all. Well, I heard there was a father, uh, father, a sister, Michael or something like that. And she was taken away in white coats in the middle of the night. So that was scary to hear about that. I, I know about Antoinette because she told me her story. Um, I think before she talked to you like a while, many years ago, or maybe a, a few months ago, actually. So like I knew about her story and I knew about a lot. And, and then other sisters I knew about too. A lot I witnessed myself um, that kind of connected the dots because she was, I don't know how many years she was in there but i was seven and a half years so you're talking about seven and a half years of history of abuse and trauma that i've seen you know or corruption and um the other part i left before the order started getting really bad i guess because there was a division and you know rome got involved and you know so i left just when you know when time was good you know for me to leave you know Although I did, I did suffer a lot. Um, I think it was hard, harder on the older sisters because they were fourteen years or more, you know, in the order, and um, they had to go through a lot of a lot of problems, not just with the order, but they couldn't they couldn't confide even into their own bishop or in, in, you know into their spiritual or even their confessor. Because um, Patrizzi had a way to find out what you were confessing to. So that that was supposed to be, t be between you, the priest, yeah. and God. The seal confession was um, wasn't. We didn't have the seal confession, mm. and a lot of times during confession, like it would be where the sisters were. You know, the superior was right where she could hear you. I see. So. God forbid you say as you committed a sin against a superior. God forbid that you had, you know, any feelings towards a superior, you know, like that were negative. Like, oh, you'd, you'd be doing penance for a long time, I guess. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> like, see, you just learned how to survive. It was, think of it as boot camp, religious boot camp. And, but it was 
with um, harassment, you know, with hazing, you know, but it's for the, it was the superiors that were doing it. And they, they got their jollies off it. They got their jollies off seeing you in pain and, and them controlling you. You know, we all know abuse is about control, you know. But there's also, like, there's a pleasure sense for the abuser, too, you know. And I think they just got off on just treating people like crap, you know. Mm. And they made a lot of money, apparently. As, as I can witness to the money belt that was tied, that was wrapped around me with duct tape. That, that had to be tempting to just bolt at that point with all that money. Where would I go, though? Yeah. I was crossed between Turkey and Italy <laughs> on Swiss Airlines trying to help a woman who's, I thought, had a heart attack. You know, yeah. was having a heart attack. You know, so it was just, it, it was a little crazy, you know. And um, you didn't have time to go in crisis either. Like, um, my crisis started, when I started breaking down, it was be- the psychosis is because, I guess, when you don't process things, um, it just comes embedded into your brain, and so it becomes like your reality, the psychosis, because you're not processing it, and you're not processing it, you know, in safe conditions. You know, they would send me to counseling, but I'd go back to the abuse, you know? So it didn't make sense. Like, why would you send me to counseling if I'm dealing with the same abuse? Oh, did I tell you the other time? One time I was sick with the flu, right? Okay. And Sister Therese said, "This is be, this is this is uh, one of the reasons why I left in 2003 too. I had the flu. It was really really sick, throwing up. She wanted everybody to come to the table and see the pictures of her family and what she's doing with her dad because I guess her dad was alive at the time. You know, um, I I asked to be excused." And she says, all you do is think of yourself. You don't care about anybody else. I was like being reamed out in front of all these sisters, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, because we had visiting sisters there too, you know, from the other convent. Um, And so then I start throwing up right on the floor. And then she says, you did that on purpose. Go to your room. I was like, so I barricaded myself for three days. Because I thought she was going to beat the crap out of me because the other sister did. Yeah, yeah, it's... you. I locked my door. I barricaded. Yeah. Yeah. You you, you start to get... You start to get this what? attitude of like, I'm sick. This is my fault. I should be ashamed of this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she basically said so. She says, you, you, you manipulate it because the mother general said... I remember at a profession in Three Rivers, Massachusetts, which is like 20, 30 minutes from where I live now. She's like, um, during the profession, she's like, if you say anything or do anything, you're going to be out of the order like that. And she like snapped her fingers. And she says, she says, I, she says, don't you ever tell anybody about what happens in, in our, in our family, in our order, you know, or your soul's going to hell. And she predicted that I would do that. Mm. So that that's a little creepy, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, I get goosebumps every time I think about that. But I'm just like, well, if my soul is going to go to hell, so be it. But I says, at least a lot of people would be safe, you know, <laughs> because I don't want this happening to anybody else, you know. But, of course, I was told, you know, definitely by the bishop. She says, no, you've done the right thing and all that stuff. But this is what... This is what the abuser does. She had control. I could have easily walked out and ran away. And I don't know why I didn't. I was in the United States. And I, and I was in my my uh, my uh, state. Massachusetts. Three Rivers. I could have easily gone home. You know. I could have somehow breathed through a fit or something. I just didn't have it in me. I was so depressed and suicidal. I just didn't care. No, you know, being dragged around like a, you know, like a, a, a dead, dead dog or something like that. That's what I felt like. Yeah. Now, Antoinette talked a little bit about this. Mike Kovacs went a little bit more in depth with this, and you just touched on a little bit. Mm-hmm. Something was predicted that somewhat came true. 
Was there other, and, and forgive me for, I'm not trying to make light of this, but was there other, other stuff that happened that seemed to have no, no logical explanation, something that, that was very much paranormal? Yes. Um, there was um, the same postulant that didn't want to do the um, taking care of the elderly. She had a demonic, they said a demonic possession, so they brought in an exorcist. Um, and then for some reason after that, I started to have that same issue. And then whenever I was advocating for somebody, and I know I'm going to get probably the same supernatural problem that's going to occur sometime soon after this. I know it. <laughs> I'm so used to it. Um, there's something connected with uh, Teresa Kovacs. Um, with, uh, there's something demonic going on and I, I, I don't know how to explain it. I just know that there's, um, there's a connection where, um, there's just where bad things happen, you know? Um, but also there is a, um, like I said, there's a certain respect um, I don't know what I would do if I see her today. I think I would have um, actually asked to get two bodyguards in front of me. <laughs> I really wouldn't want to see it. I think there's something dark, deep and sinister that's going on because one, when a religious superior of an order, you know, theologically falls into disobedience, Everything caves. So that means that God is no longer living in that person. So who would come and live in that person but Satan himself, right? So I think the supernatural um, is pretty evident because there was practicing, they were practicing dark rituals or whatever. I, I don't know how to explain it. Um, but I sense it because what I experienced from this postulant, um, but also there is a deep, um, there's a postulant, um, Bernadette, okay? She was with me when I was final professed and she um, was in Connecticut and she was cutting herself, like, you know, she was only 15 years old. She mm -hmm. was a minor, okay? Um, I saw that there, there was a connection with her and Teresa. Do you know to this day, Bernadette goes over her house with her kids to see Teresa? Wow. Yeah. Wow. So that there's a deep, dark connection, you know. Um, there's connection with, there's, there's deep, dark things that are probably in the Vatican, too, and uh, something to do with Patrizzi. I don't know. Um, we always, because of St. Maximum, Colby talks about fighting against Freemasonry and stuff, but I'm wondering if that was a cover-up, you know, because, I, you know, I've witnessed some, um, I've had dark, deep, um, supernatural things happen, um, in my sleep and then someone would have to wake me up, you know, like, cause a, a sister, in, in fact, sister Charlene would wake me up and it always had something to do connection with the order, you know? And then I still have every once in a while, some really horrifying nightmares, demonic in nature, you know? And I know it's connected with them. Um, because I never had that when I was a child, you know, I never had that before entering in. So I know it's coming from that. And it was explained to me, well, that is your person buying the abuse and trauma, but I think it's something deeper and darker. I really do. Um, working with um, exorcists, deliverance, um, healing priests, working with, you know, just on myself, you know, a Catholic counselor, I, we, we do find that in common that there's something there, there's something that cannot be let go, no matter how hard you try. There's something about the order that is a mark. It's, it's like you're marked with something, you know?
And it's weird because I was just thinking today, and this may sound gross, but I was thinking about what has happened in my life and then I was reflecting about what happened in the order and I just says, really, I feel like, you know, like that I'm pregnated with the semen of Satan, you know? And um, that being, you know, that's how dark it feels, mm -hmm. you know? And it's just like, you can't make sense of it with your senses. But on a spiritual plane, you've been there, you do make sense of it because you know, I've seen this before in the order. I've seen it in the superiors, you know? I've seen when their eyes have like gone to complete hatred, like they want to kill you, you know, type of thing. Why do you think I barricaded myself? When Sister Stella ran after me, I put my feet up. She she hit me, you know, I had bruises on my arms, mm -hmm. you know? But I was defending myself. I've been physically abused as a child, so I kind of knew what physical abuse was by the time I was a sister. But there was, um, like, you knew that there was something not of God in them at that point. And you're not going just on, like, um, trying to just survive. You're going on, like, you want to get as far as way as possible from that. You do not want to be a part of it. And that was another thing. I started isolating myself and barricading myself, too, because I'm just like, this is from, not from God. This is not of God. So what is it, you know? So you had to discern when you didn't have the right tools to do, to discern. How could you discern something like this? You know, your young sister... Even though you're a final profess, you're walking into a complete, like, hell on earth. That's what it was. It was hell, you know? It wasn't, there was nothing heaven about it. Even when I would do adoration, there was so much guilt or so much, like, darkness. You couldn't even feel Jesus in the chapel. All you would feel is the darkness, the demons. And, and, in fact, and many times I had to run out of the, the chapel because I was just so intense for me you know mm -hmm. and that's when they said don't force her to go into the chapel leave her alone you know because i was like i said one not processing two like not i was still being confronted with abuse and three there's something definitely supernatural that was going on you know and, and it took a while for me to even go back to, to normal church after i left the order it took me like i don't know three years or so at least, you know, and I used to go to mass every single day as a sister, yeah. you know, so that was hard. That was very, very hard. And you would think, and, 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 and a lot of times I remember telling my spiritual direct, director, I says, I feel like I'm more of a child of Satan than I'm a child of God, you know, and that would puzzle them. I said, but you don't understand. I says, what has happened? It's almost like it, you're initiated into being being part of you know this this darkness you know and um a lot of people still don't understand that you don't you can't really understand it unless you've gone through it you know or you know somebody like real close that has gone through it and you know you have that empathy but i mean most people don't understand that so I hope I answered your question. <laughs> Ab absolutely. Absolutely. Is uh, before we wrap this up and, and believe me, we can go another, we can go another seven hours if you like, I don't care. But before we do, is there anything you want to add? Uh, any stories, anything at all? Well, I do want to add um, that it is very crucial and important when somebody Go, says that they're being abused in religious life by the clergy or whatever. Listen, listen up because it's happening, number one. Because nobody wants to go through the hell, you know, of reporting something. And um, I did want to say, even though Bishop Dupre and Bishop um, uh, Lori and Egan were, didn't do anything, I do want to comment that Rosansky at least paid attention but he didn't really do anything to help me but it was bishop um william Byrne, who is our bishop now he says you are a flock of my you know you are a sheep of my flock i think you should get counseling you know catholic counseling that is the first 
and then I sh and then um, they help with retreats and so there is help now people are starting to recognize there are some dioceses that are starting to recognize important of helping survivors not many dioceses out there but there's still like this sense of covering up you know like i'm not saying it's from the bishop or anything but i said in the church in general there's a fear of bringing out the laundry you know into the air you know and dealing with that um so I wanted to say that is like, first of all, one, you know, if you are suffering something like this, you know, look me up, abuse testimony, I'm on Facebook. Um, and then I'll be happy to talk to you or, you know, whatever message you. And, 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 and two, it's just like, if you, you need, you need to say something, don't, don't be quiet about it. You know, because if it's happening to you, it's happening to other people. And that's the biggest lesson I had to learn, you know. And the most painful lesson was is I had to wait for 10 years for something to get done, you know. And, and then I found out all these other abuses were happening during those 10 years. So I don't want that to happen to anybody else. Uh, three final questions, uh, okay. if I may. And if any mm -hmm. of these hit on a sensitive subject and you don't want to answer perfectly fine uh whenever whenever mike kovacs first reached out to you and you found out he was teresa's brother and teresa's own brother is trying to disassemble this cult what was your reaction to that well i was sure first shocked um because i thought it was just me that I was a problem, you know, I was a bad sister or whatever. Um, but then I understood that there was abuse. So the back of my mind knew that eventually the story was going to come out. Okay. Um, you've, you've heard Mike's testimony. You've heard Antoinette's testimony. Is there anything that they have said that seems untrue, misremembered, anything like that. Well, with Antoinette, she was suffering at Sarahville. I was in, the, in a whole different area. And um, so when I hear these stories, there is a common pattern of control and abuse. And there is a validation of what they suffered is very similar to what I suffered and many others suffered. So I don't doubt her or doubt Michael in any way. I just can't say that I was there when it happened. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the final, the toughie, I asked this of Antoinette too. If mm -hmm. you now could go back and speak to Patrizzi and Kovacs then, what would you say to them? I would say why you know i still have that big question in my brain like why you know what motivated you to to be like this i would want to know why yeah. patricia bud thank you so much for being on this episode you have a wonderful day you too you take care Thank you for joining us once again on the Cult of SMMI. Patricia asked me to add the following. Patrizzi and Kovacs would hide about any sisters who left or any problems. They feared the truth coming out. They would prey on the sisters who were physically, mentally, spiritually sick or weak. That included almost everyone. Often, I wish I'd died this is hard to live day in and day out, being robbed of our vocation and our relationships with God. They were a perverse, sadistic order. Surviving this is a continuous suffering that never ends. That's why it's vital for the truth to come out, to help other survivors to heal. Only through advocating does my own life become purposeful. If you, uh, a family member, 
or a friend were a member of the Sisters Minor of Mary Immaculate, please reach out to me at strangepathwaysmail at gmail.com. I want to hear your story. Whether your story corroborates anything that has been said in this series, or if it seems that everything in this series does not corroborate, that it refutes what these people are saying, we want to hear from you. That email, once again, strangepathwaysmail at gmail.com. Thank you once again for joining us here this week. Take care of yourselves and each other. Thank you.